We have a very special mic'd up to bring you tonight as we remember the legacy of former Louisiana head baseball coach Tony Robichaud, who died last July. Tonight, to talk about Robe, we bring on two people, his right-hand man for so many years, Anthony Babineau, and then, of course, former Cajun baseball great Gunnar Leger joins us to talk. Gentlemen, I appreciate you coming on. Coach, I wanted to ask you, this season, there was so much going on throughout the year, and, and there were so many obstacles. Was there a robism that you ever kind of leaned on to kind of power you through the uncertain times? Man, I get, I get asked that question a lot, you know, and, and there's, there's so many of them. And, you know, have, having heard so many of them, you know, over and over for the last 25 years, I just, I use all of them, really. You know, I mean, there's not really one that sticks out to me. Uh, I know for, for the players and coaches that have spent, you know, two, three, four, five, seven years, whatever with him, you know, they have a certain one. But, you know, when you're with someone for 25 years every day uh, of your life, man, it, it you kind of just encapsulate everything that that he said and, and that he uses on a daily basis. So, you know, just um, just the thought of him on a daily basis and a remembrance of how he would get through things and push through things. That's really what's what's kept me going over this last year. It's been tough, no doubt, uh, without him here. Um, and like I said, I think about him every day. We all think about him every day, but. Uh, just uh, the lessons that he's taught all of us and, and especially me being with him for so long. It's something that, you know, I definitely cherish. Gunner, when you look back at your time with Robe, what is one lesson that he taught you that shows up in your day, shows up in your life every day? Uh, I say recently, um, I'm actually wearing the band. It says work while you wait. Um, I guess I've, you know, with everything that's happened with COVID and just kind of how my career has unfolded the past couple of years. And, you know, you know, you start to think, you know, should I be doing this? Is there something else I should be doing? Whatever it may be. And like he always said, you know, work while you wait and, and be ready whenever, whenever the Lord cracks that door open, you know, whether he busts it wide open, there's just a, you know, a little bit of a sliver of light, you know, you got to be ready for when that happens. So, I mean, that, that's gotten me through a handful of workouts and, a handful of things um, recently, so. And of course, Robe was was a pitcher's guy. Is there a, a lesson on the field that you think has stuck with you in in maybe your approach? Oh, I mean, man, he he transformed me into you know the pitcher that I was in college. Um, you know, commanding the ball and commanding the game was was always what I did and what I was good at. But you know, he took it to a whole nother level, and you know, he did it his whole career, and that's why. Uh, you know, that's why UL has the, um, the his a history of that, you know, developing pitchers and, and you just go back and look at, look at his numbers when he was the coach there and they were, you know, usually tops in the league and tops in the country. So coach this year, uh, as short as it was, there was still a different voice leading the locker room. How different was it for you and for the players? Well, it was much different, you know, as you mentioned, a, a different voice leading the locker room. But, you know, the great thing about it was it was a voice that at least I was familiar with um, and, and a voice that, that the players weren't familiar with the voice. But, you know, the players were familiar with Matt Deggs and, and what he did when he was here, what he had done at Sam Houston as the head coach. So although the voice wasn't familiar, you know, the name was so. That made it a little easier, you know, and, and as we went throughout the, the fall in preparation for the spring and the 17 games that, that we were fortunate to play this spring, you know, Tony's name was brought up a lot, a whole lot. I mean, we still based just about everything that we did off of the teachings of Tony Robichaud. show. You know, Matt Degg stands for a lot of, if not all the things that Tony stood for. So in that aspect, things were, were able to transition pretty smoothly. But like I mentioned, you know, his name was brought up many, many times um, so that the players could not just remember him for the ones that had played for him, but for the new guys to get an understanding of what he meant to this program, to this university, to this city, his legacy, the history that he built here. We wanted to make sure 
and will continue to make sure that guys know that that this is a program that that he built uh, and that he put his name on. We have a special mic'd up tonight as we are talking with Anthony Babineau and Gunnar Leje about the legacy of Coach Tony Robichaux, the former Louisiana baseball coach who died last July. Coach Babs, uh, was there ever was there ever a moment where the players got past the raw emotion of everything? It was such a short season. Uh, was, was there a point, and when was that point that they, they finally kind of moved on beyond the emotions of everything? Well, I think that was different for everyone. Um, you know, th there wasn't really a, a one finite day or instance, obviously, that, that everybody got past it. Uh, um, you know, everybody dealt with it differently for some of the players that were there in you know 2019 and beyond that had been coached by him i watched those guys deal with it you know it was tougher for those guys to deal with with his passing obviously because they had a history with him for the guys that had just gotten to the program they had met tony but just about all of them had met them just once you know on their recruiting visit so they didn't really have a, a history with him so for those guys, it was a little easier to get over uh, his passing. You know, they still mourned it, obviously, because the guy that they committed to in the recruiting process was not going to be their coach. So that was tough on them. But because there wasn't, as I said, that history with him, they got over it a little bit better. You know, for some of the guys that have been there two, three, four years, I mean, I watched them grieve. Uh, I really did. Uh, I mean, you know, you had some days early on at, at practice once when the fall started that, you know, I'd see some guys just kind of all by themselves and, and yeah, I'd walk up to them and, and, you know, they were crying just because they missed him and, and they know what what he meant to them. So everybody dealt with it uh, a little differently. I know for me, I was able to speak to Colleen probably once every couple of weeks, you know, to Justin, to Austin, to Ashley. Um, whether it be me reaching out to them, them reaching out to me. So to, the, to have them to be able to reach out to and, and speak to was good for me and a, and a good release and, and an outlet for me. But, you know, it was tough on everybody. It, it really was. Gunnar, when people want to talk about Coach Robichaux to you, I'm sure you have a go-to story you like to tell them. What is that story? <laughs> oh, boy. He's <laughs> Coach Bad's laughing, too. There's a lot of stories. Um, you know, I, I just think that anyone that ever spent any time around him or even, you know, guys walking into his office and I can remember multiple times where I was sitting in his office talking to him about whatever it may be um, and guys would call him and it was, you know, hey, coach, can I have a minute? I need to talk to you about this. And it was, you know, maybe a high school coach from right down the road and he would take the time out of his day and either say that or say, you know, I'll call you right back. And I just remember every instance that I saw him had the opportunity to help somebody, whether he had to go out of his way or whatever it may be, he always did it. Um, his door was always open. You know, he was always sharing knowledge and, and trying to do anything he could to help whoever it was. Um, didn't matter the situation or who it was. Um, I think anybody that spent any sort of time around him, you know, got that from him. Um, and so I, I, that's the one thing I'll, I'll always remember is just how, you know, how open he was with what he knew or, you know, wh whatever help he could provide to anyone. You know, Coach, just we'll if, if, I, if I could, right. Andrew, just to kind of piggyback on what Gunner said right there about Tony always having time for, for people. He really honestly, truly could not help that trait of his like he could not and Gunnar will attest to this he could not not have time for someone I know that that you know me I, I was fortunate to be with him 25 years and and I learned I mean I'm a patient person I, I think I think Gunnar would attest to that but you know there's times where all of us we kind of lose our lose our patience with things and you know one of Tony's things kind of throughout his career and he would sometimes walk up to practice a few minutes tardy you know um he always put the guys first but he would sometimes you know get to practice a few minutes tardy and 
but it was because he was he was talking to someone, you know. And I remember one day he and I were having a conversation and, and you know, about it was at the end of a year. We would always talk about things to to do for the next year to, to get better, you know. And I told him he asked me, he said, you know, Bab, what can I do? How can I how can I get to practice on time? How can I be better with that? I told him, I said, Tony, I said, your biggest problem is at 1.30 in the afternoon, when someone walks into your office to speak to you, you do not have the ability to tell them, hey, Mr. So-and-so, listen, I'm sorry. I have to go get changed for practice because I have to be out on the practice field at two o'clock. Like you don't have the ability to tell them that. You, you, they come in, you spend time with them, and then you know you get to the field a little late. But I said, you know, you can you can say that you're trying to get to the field on time, but you're also helping and, and you're helping whoever needs you at that time. He just and he, he agreed with me. He said, "Bab, he said I can't I can't tell him no. He just he really could not do that. He, it just it wasn't possible for him to do. And, and Gunner would have done. Gunner just attested to that." I'll ask one more question to the both of you. It'll be the same question. Was there ever a moment this season that you wanted to just pick up the cell phone and, and call Robe? And, and what did you want to tell him? Well, I know for me, I mean, I wanted to pick up the phone and call him as soon as COVID-19 hit. <laughs> because no telling what his position or stance would have been on everything that's going on right now. But there's no doubt would have been a position and a stance that he would have f felt wholeheartedly uh, uh, and passionate about. And we, we've talked in the office, me and Matt and, and JT and Wells, we're like, there's so many reasons that we wish that Tony was still here, but probably none more so than just to hear what his take would be on what's going on right now, to hear what his advice would be, to hear how he would counsel the players on what's going on right now from the pandemic to the social unrest just to to go for him for advice so for me that's that's when I really wish that he was here that I could pick up the phone and say hey how do I handle all this that's going on right now Gunner yeah I mean similar for me I mean obviously I wasn't there this this past shortened season but um, just in my personal life and kind of everything that's happened with you know, minor league baseball and COVID and just everything in general um, growing up, you know, um, there's plenty of times where similar to what Bab just said, you, you just wish you could call him and say, hey, what the hell do I do here? You know, like what what's your advice? Um, and, and like I said earlier, that's that's what he was able to do for so many people. You know, it was if, if any anybody had the question, you know, what do I do? What do you think? He always had an answer and it was he believed wholeheartedly in it, you know, and and I think that's what made him so, you know, so unbelievable as a coach and why everyone respected him so much is because he could, you know, he could get that across to the players and, and we believed what he believed, you know, um, and we bought into it. Um, no, I mean, there's been numerous occasions where uh, me and my dad were just talking about that not too long ago. My dad, you know, we we're talking about all the COVID stuff and the season getting canceled and everything like that. And my dad said, you know, it would sure be nice to have, Coach Rogue to lean on for some advice. And I said, yeah, you're right about that. So. Well, gentlemen, I really appreciate you coming on with me today. This is Anthony Babineau, longtime right-hand man to head coach Tony Robichaux, and Gunnar Leje, former Cajun great. Gentlemen, I appreciate you coming on and opening up about the legacy of Coach Tony Robichaux. Absolutely, Andrew. Thanks for having us, Gunnar. Great to see you. Yeah, you too, Coach. Thanks for having us.